Every living thing has a soul, their inner magic, their innate power, what makes you, you. There are many definitions for what a soul is, but what is understood is that everyone has one. What people forget is that plants are living things. Doesn't that mean that they should have souls too? Dryads are fey creatures of the woods who take on beautiful female forms. They speak to the trees and the animals and use them to protect themselves against intruders. Very rarely seen, a dryad would never be found unless she wishes to be. Let's go ahead and see what the monster manual tells us about this monster. First it says that they are tree bound. Powerful fey will sometimes bind lesser fey spirits to trees, transforming them into dryads. This is sometimes done as punishment when the fey spirit falls in love with a mortal and that love is forbidden. A dryad can emerge from the tree and travel to the lands around it, but the tree remains her home and roots her to the world. As long as the tree remains healthy and unharmed, the dryad stays forever youthful and alluring. If the tree is harmed, she suffers, and if it is destroyed, the dryad will descend into madness. Further, it says that they are shy and reclusive, but when struck by the beauty of a stranger, they might come out to investigate and maybe even lure the individual to charm him. Even though they are reclusive, they will work together with other creatures of the forest to defend it. Lastly, it says here they can speak with plants and animals. They can teleport from one tree to another and can beguile humanoids with her enchantments, turning enemies into friends. Now, by looking at its stat block, we can see some of these effects in action. Magical resistance, of course, since she is a fey creature. She can speak with animals and plants. There is the ability to teleport through trees right here and the very powerful fey charm, a 24 hour improvement version of the charm spell. Very powerful stuff. They did however leave a lot of stuff out though, probably because of the lack of space. And the tree stride ability is also kind of misleading and, and missing some very important details. As always, we're gonna go back to other D&D books, previous monster manuals, and official canon monster lore articles to see what is missing from this entry. Let's talk about what the monster manual does not tell you about dryads. The first thing that we should cover is what they actually look like. I figure this is probably the most crucial thing to know about this creature. See, dryads straight up just look like elvish women, like young, beautiful elvish women. In many representations, you might see dryads portrayed as having wood skin, but that's because of the spell bark skin, which every dryad knows and uses when dealing with any intruder in her domain. If you find a dryad in a forest, she will be using bark skin basically, unless you catch her by surprise, which is extremely unlikely. In fact, much of the lore about dryads in Dungeons and Dragons is that they're actually fairly difficult to tell apart from an elvish woman, unless you know what you're looking for. See, dryads actually change skin color and hair color depending on the season. Quote, the dryad's exquisite features, delicate and finely chiseled, are much like an elf maiden's. Dryads have high cheekbones and amber, violet, or dark green eyes. A dryad's complexion and hair color changes with the seasons, presenting the sprite with natural camouflage. During the fall, Dryad's hair turn golden or red, and her skin subtly darkens from its usual light tan to more closely match her hair color. This enables her to blend with the falling leaves of autumn. In winter, both the Dryad's hair and skin are white, like the snows that cover the oak groves. When encountered in a forest during fall or winter, a Dryad is often mistaken for an attractive maid, probably of elvish descent. No one would mistake a dryad for an elf maid during the spring and summer, however. At these times of year, a dryad's skin is slightly tanned and her hair is green, like the oak leaves around her." End quote. The point here is, it is very easy to tell that a dryad is a dryad when her hair is green, but otherwise it might be actually fairly difficult. Here you can see the official art for the dryad in first edition. 
2nd edition, and 3rd edition. They literally just look like women. It's also interesting and funny in some ways because dryads don't mind either way whether they are wearing clothes or not, so most of the time they're running around naked in the forest, or at least close to naked. It is described to us how it is a very popular pastime of young boys that live close to the forest to go into the forest to try and sneak a peek of the dryad's naked body. Now, generally this is not dangerous as dryads are very shy and when found will generally just merge into a tree and leave, but it is also very unlikely for it to happen anyways since dryads can speak to animals and plants, and they will tell the dryad that there are intruders nearby, giving her ample time to run away. Now, I say that this is generally not dangerous, but that doesn't mean that it is always safe. If a boy is attractive enough, it might pique the interest of the dryad, and if that happens, she will attempt to charm him. When this happens, well, you're pretty screwed. The charm of a dryad is incredibly potent. It is very difficult to avoid, and when it hits you, it'll keep you afflicted for years. When men get lost in the woods and never come back, many times over, this is what happens. See, when a dryad finds a really handsome man, she will try to charm him in order to turn him into her romantic slave. She will bring the man over to her tree and basically make him live there, and for the next couple of years, the man will do everything that she asks of him. This charm effect is particularly odd because whether or not you manage to break out of it is actually based on how how intelligent you are. An adult accomplished wizard would realize that he's being charmed probably after the first week, but a young boy will likely be in trance for a couple of decades. This is why the dryad tends to target younger men more often, because they are more likely to fall into trance for longer. This is also why she will never target an elf or a half-elf with her charm unless her life is in danger because she knows that elves are very resistant to charm effects. Now, the behavior of those who are charmed and how the dryad acts around them is actually pretty interesting. Quote, the young men never want to be rescued. Dryads are especially good at hiding their fellows, and the men are entranced, so they will do anything to avoid being rescued. If the dryad wants, she can even cause her fellow to merge with her oak tree's soul by her magic. Then it is very hard to bring him home. The dryad who has the lad isn't much help and will deny having ever seen him. If I come and take the boy away, she will pout and look as if she'd lost a cherished toy. She likes to have the young man cater to her whims and bring her things, and he lives for nothing but the chance to stare blissfully at his true love. Sometimes her spell over the young man will wear off, and the dryad will sigh and give the boy something to remember her by, a few coins, a gem or two, something like that. When the fellow reaches home, he usually discovers that he's been away for several years." End quote. Now, I don't need to tell you what happens when a dryad collects herself a love slave, but she can indeed get pregnant. The result of the union between a human or elf with a dryad will always result in a dryad little girl. Dryads only have one sex, and that is female, so you will never see a dryad male. Conversely, it is the opposite for satyrs. Satyrs can only be male, and they are known to be womanizers who love the debauchery, so constantly they find themselves impregnating dryads. And when this happens, there is a 50% chance that the baby will be a dryad female or a satyr male, and nothing else. Now, since clearly they didn't descend from a common ancestor, Druids consider this to be part of the, quote, perversity of magic, end quote. Now, I want to go a little bit deeper into how a dryad cares for her child, but for me to actually talk about that, I need to cover first the nature of how a dryad is normally created. That is, we have to talk about the binding that a dryad has with her tree, because that information is kind of needed before you can understand her child caring. See, just how elves, humans, and dwarves have souls, so do plants, but in a lesser form. There is, however, one type of plant that, generally speaking, tends to have auras with similar strength that to some humans. 
Those are oak trees. Oak trees are considered sacred to druids because of this, since it is the closest that a plant can get in terms of a soul to the power of a human. See, this is cool. The monster manual didn't tell you this, but dryads can only be bonded to an oak tree. And that oak tree has to be at least 50 years or older. See, legends say that dryads are the souls of really old oak trees given shape and will. The reality is more mysterious than that though. We are told two things. First, we're told, quote, certain oak trees in ages past were invested with a special gift and could form their tree souls into animate shapes, end quote. In the fifth edition monster manual, we're told, quote, powerful Fey will sometimes bind lesser Fey spirits to trees, transforming them into dryads." End quote. The interesting thing about dryads is that their creation is fairly malleable. M magic can do many incredible things, especially when it comes to Fey creatures and Fey magic. Indeed, you can create a dryad with sheer power, like Fey lords do, but if the oak tree is big enough and has a strong enough aura, it can actually create one by itself. Now, the dryad will be bound to her oak tree, and they will, for the most part, act like one. If the tree is hurt, she will feel it. If the tree is destroyed, then she will die. If the tree is healthy, then the dryad will look forever young and beautiful. During most of the year, when the tree enjoys bright sunlight and has ample sustenance from the ground, then the dryad need not eat at all. But during the winter months, when the tree hibernates and its growth slows, you will find the dryad actually consuming nuts and berries to help sustain themselves. The dryad will also hibernate most of the time during winter, just like her tree. This is why it is so difficult to find dryads during winter. See, the dryad and the tree are basically one. For the most part, she is a manifestation of the aura of the tree. What the monster metal doesn't tell you is what happens when the dryad goes far from the tree. See, there's actually a range as to how far she can go from her tree. The range changes a bit probably depending on how big the tree is, but generally speaking, it is about 1000 feet in range. The closer the dryad is to reaching her maximum range, the more uneasy she will start to feel. This range the dryads call the tarot. So, the Terrell will be the maximum zone that the Dryad will ever be able to explore. If she were to go farther than her Terrell, she will start feeling symptoms of starvation, depression, and exhaustion, which is lethal if nothing is done. Unless she is brought back into her Terrell, death is sure to come for her within 12 to 36 hours. To a cleric, this would actually look to him as her soul wasting away, a, a process that the Dryad will call Glergimmer. Essentially, death by keeping her away from her tree. Glyrgimmer starts rapidly, as soon as she leaves her terrell. It is almost instantaneously that she will start feeling sick, and generally speaking, a dryad doesn't know how large her terrell is unless she literally and physically paces it out. Now, what's really interesting is that the powerful heal spell will actually negate the symptoms of Glyrgimmer for four hours. But after the four hours have expired, the dryad will start feeling sick again if she hasn't been brought back into her tarot. What's even cooler though are some of the different interactions that spells can have on these restrictions that dryads possess. See, scholars sometimes call dryads parasites, even though it is not entirely fair. This is because even though a dryad might have been born out of an oak tree and is literally soul linked to that tree, it doesn't mean that there aren't ways to change that. Like I said before, magic can be very malleable. You can actually magically sever the connection between a dryad and her oak tree using a form of exorcism, though this is very, very rare and the vast majority of dryads wouldn't even know that this is a possibility. That's because, well, generally speaking, true exorcism spells are very rare to find. In 5th edition, typically the spell used for this sort of thing is the 5th level Dispel Evil and Good. A spellcaster that knows 5th level spells is pretty rare in the wilds. An exorcism spell such as that one will, quote, separate the dryad from the tree's soul. In this event, the dryad must find another suitable oak tree within 7 days or the Glyrgimmer symptoms will begin, end quote. This is the only way we know to actually move a dryad from an oak tree to another, but alas, even then, the dryad must at the end pick an oak tree to link to, for without one she will die. 
Now, I needed to cover all of that before coming back to child raising because, like I said before, it, it sort of matters. When a dryad has a baby with a human, it will always be a girl and it will always be a dryad. But the cool thing is that the little girl will live with her mom dryad in her tree. Quote, the female child of a dryad will stay with her for 12 years. If the child is a satyr, the mother will turn the boy over to his father's band for his upbringing. A girl child will spend the first few years of her life attached to her mother's tree. When the girl comes of age, she will be taken to an oak tree of her own and will become attached to it naturally. The child then becomes a part of that tree's soul and will live there for the rest of her days. She will rarely see her mother after that, but she will be happy and content with her life." End quote. If you remember before, I mentioned that dryads are very solitary and you can see it in here too. The mother will rarely, if ever, see her child again and vice versa and they will be happy with that. See, sometimes you might find a group of dryads together, but if you do, it would be purely coincidental. It happens sometimes that grand oak trees happen to exist close to each other, so dryads might see and find each other around as they explore their terrell, but they rarely hang out or do any form of social gatherings. They will help each other fight common enemies or defend themselves against attacks on the forest, but that's the extent of their socializing. Now, I should mention a child dryad will not have any of the powers that her mother has, and she will continue to not have them until she's at least 12 years of age and until she finds an oak tree of her own. Until then, the only ability that she will have is the ability to speak with plants, but that's it. She won't even have the ability to speak with animals until she gets her tree. Now, contrary to popular belief, dryads don't actually have built-in homes inside or under their grand oak trees. Instead, when they go into their tree, they literally merge together with it, becoming fully intangible. She basically conjoins with the soul of the tree. While well, she's inside in such a manner, she cannot be interacted with in any way except, of course, by damaging her oak tree, which will surely get her out into a frenzy. She can also use this power with other trees in the forest, but not really for long. What she can do, though, is use any of the trees of the forest as a gateway towards her home tree. Now, this is the part in the monster manual that I mentioned before was a little bit misleading, and I think it's actually fairly vital. See, dryads can use any tree within their terrell to instantly teleport back to their home tree, basically teleporting hundreds of feet towards safety if the situation needed it. This teleportation is actually quite amazing. Now, when it comes to treasure, dryads don't really look for or care that much about it. The only treasure that a dryad would ever have would be whatever charmed adventurers would give her as a gift, which she would keep hidden under the branches of her tree. This might be a good way to find out actually which oak tree in a forest houses a dryad, since generally speaking, there is no cool way of finding one out. A dryad's tree looks just like an ordinary grand oak tree, and it will not feel magical at all in any way. I repeat, a dryad's oak tree will not feel magical in any way. They do not ooze or look magical. Finding one is always a big hassle because of this. Now, when it comes to hobbies and pastimes, of course, outside of finding love slaves, dryads enjoy making things pretty. Not for anyone else's sake or for attention, but just for themselves. They perfume themselves with crushed flower blossoms and style their hair with bits of flowers, leaves, and other woodland growths. Sometimes a dryad will find a way to trade some of her meager treasure for soon garments. But like I said before, dryads generally are just as happy without clothing as they are with it. See, in the Fey Kingdom, dryads are considered to be in the sprite category, which means they are basically obsessed with beauty and most of what they do is to seek and try and find beauty in the world. Dryads are very free creatures and have all the time in the world to make the forest as beautiful as they can. That's because they will live for as long as their oak tree lives for. Now, some oak trees only get to live about 80 years, but others can live for as long as 600 years, depending on the type. And as long as the tree is healthy, then the dryad will look beautiful, vibrant, and young. Just make sure to keep your boys away from the forest. 
Thank you so much for watching the video. I would like to personally thank my patron supporters, Rukato Fan, Major Fail Gaming, Wyatt Curlin, Barry Mascant, 5E Magic Shop, Anthony Clias, Toby Oliver, Yog Jaguth, Lord of Dreams, Daniel Umar, Zach Bowell, Max D, Noah Perkins, Simon Holman, and Meaty Ogre at best for supporting me on Patreon at the $25 level. If you would like to support me as well, then please head on over to patreon.com slash Mr. Rex to support. Guys, thank you so much for watching the video. And if you want to see more content like this, then make sure to head on over to the playlist. There are tons of D&D videos just like this one where I cover monsters from the Monster Manual and what they don't actually tell you in the 5th edition Monster Manual that they actually told you on some of the previous editions. So make sure to go in there and watch them because there are tons of them and I'm sure that you're going to love them. Thank you one final time for watching and I will see you all on the next video. Bye-bye.